Well, is this, I think, if I'm counting correctly, because I'm so great at math, this should be episode three? Yep. We're getting, Have we done it? We're getting to the upper limits of your counting ability with, with episode three. <laughs> I only have a couple of fingers left on this hand, so I don't know. It should be number three, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm I'm enjoying this thing. I think I think we should keep doing it for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to keep going, and it's been it's fun to not only like like we said in the first couple episodes, this is the kind of stuff, the kind of topics we've already been having a lot together, and with different coworkers and people we know. And even more so since starting this, I've been having conversations or thoughts or something. Where I'm like, ooh, that should be part of an episode. Or, ooh, I want to talk to Josh about that. And uh, so now I, I think about it even more because I want to put it into into this content. So <laughs> Same, which reminds me. I've got something super dorky to talk about. I think it's dorky, but I also think it's cool because okay. this, this is what I do. But I, I don't know. Because we're also using this as an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better. How much of like a literature guy are you? Do you read a lot? Not as much as I used to be. And I never was. I would never consider myself a super literature guy. Whatever that, yeah, super into literature. I, uh, I've i read books every now and then. And during school, I've read lots of books. As I've gotten older, I've, started, I've read less fiction and more nonfiction. Um, more you know, how to guide self help, uh, research based stuff or psychology, marketing and branding type stuff. So um, I read every now and then, but I wouldn't consider myself a literature guy. <laughs> I back in the day, I fancied myself a creative writer and that I would publish short stories and fiction and um, took a lot of creative writing courses and nice read a whole lot and I still care a lot about like literature and fiction and I, I think it's fascinating I, I don't read as much as I used to but it's just because TV and life I don't, not a really a great excuse but um, are you familiar with David Foster Wallace? Yes I mean to, to a degree I know who he is and I know his somewhat viral DFW. and I know his somewhat viral uh, graduation speech about this is water um, right. And I know, I know of, that's kind of the extent to which I've engaged with him. I know he's written some stuff that's been pretty well known and I've kind of read a little bit about him, but I haven't read much of his stuff myself, but I am aware of who he is. Yeah. I, I, I know people have very strong opinions about him. You're either like a total Stan or like you hate his guts. I don't think he was probably that great of a human being. Um, I'm sad that he's dead because I like his writing, but so I've read a lot of his stuff and I was just finishing um, this short story book called uh, The Girl with Curious Hair. And the final short story in it, this is just, it's just weird to me. It's called, I can never remember the name. It's a weird name. The, it's called Westward, the Course of Empire Takes Its Way. That's the name of the story. And I can't remember. That's that's a reference to something. Hmm. If I was more of a nerd, I'd remember what that reference was. But read moral of the story. The, what? Read it one more time. I want to hear it again. Westward, the Course of Empire Takes Its Way. Okay. Okay, so the premise is there's this advertiser named J.D. Steelritter who um, is, he's a preeminent, like, um, marketing genius. That's, like, who he is in life. And he's famous for his work with McDonald's. And the premise of the story is he is gathering in the middle of nowhere, Illinois, every single person who's still alive that has ever been in a McDonald's commercial. And he's gathering their, them there to have this like one giant, like mega ad. Okay. Basically. And there's a whole lot of, it's a really long kind of almost like a novella. Like it's, it's a long story and there's a lot of weird bunny trails, but it kind of follows this one group of people who are trying to get to this 
like reunion. Two of them were previously in ads and one of them's like a significant other who's coming along and um, they end up having all sorts of weird conversations and jokes about, you know, like marketing being the genius for repurposing a product that wasn't supposed to be what it actually is, but now it's something else and interesting stuff. But one of the characters starts like daydreaming about their future and the their group's future and where they're going to go. And one of them, it, they make a comment about what they feel like the essence of advertising is. And I just want to get your take on this quote. Essence of advertising. Yeah, I'm curious. Let's go. Um, the key to all ingenious and effective and original advertising is not the compelled creation of all new jingles and images but the simple arrangement of old words and older pictures into relationships the consumer already believes are true. Can I think about it for a minute? Yeah. I gave you zero prep work for this. Oh, good. I should have sent you the quote. And Matt, I haven't heard this before. I'm glad, I'm not mad. I'm glad you're sharing this with me, but I'm like, yeah, I definitely should have read this before. And this is interesting. Can you read one more time? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The key to all ingenious and effective and original advertising is not the compelled creation of all new jingles and images, but the simple arrangement of old words and older pictures into relationships the consumer already believes are true. You want me to respond to that? Yeah. For one, is that is that accurate? I think it, not to, to split hairs here, but I think of the very first part of that is needs to be broken it. What do you mean by the genius? I'm going to misquote it now. The su like successful or good or genius advertising. By what measuring stick are you making that claim? Is it does it have to sell product? Does it have to create brand? Effective brand? was one of those metrics that Effective. you mentioned. Does it have to yeah. just resonate with people? Does it have to go viral? Is it what is your what do you mean by that? Because then it could be more or less true depending on how you're evaluating that. But I like the part where it talked about, and again, I'm just quoting it, I'm sure, but um, connections that people already, what did it say, thought were there, or thought or believed in or something like that? Relationships that that they already know are true. That one. I like that, and I, I need more time to think about it before I like plant my flag on that hill, but I think I agree with that because that's a, a creative way of, of capturing that Oftentimes in advertising, we'll say, you know, emotion drives people to do stuff or make an emotional connection. And that's kind of the, just the fast way to, to capture that essence. But it really is that where everyone has a different experience, different perspective, different opinion. Um, we view the world a little bit uniquely to ourselves, but a good advertisement or good storytelling, which I think is an aspect of good advertisement, is something that mass audience or at least your target audience can resonate with and understand ideally without, without you having to blast it in their face and tell them what you're saying, but like connect to that. Right. Which I think is that element of like, ah, uh, I, yep. I get what you're, I get what you're saying and I understand it. And I, you've captured something that is recognizable to me. So that line, especially I, I think is true or I want to think it's true. I need to play with it a little bit more, but what do you think? What did you, thought about as you did that yeah i uh i kind of i'm kind of in agreement that, that that's true like there's nothing there's nothing new like we can create new brands new products but all stories are the same they all have the same root to them there's nothing truly new ever in my humble opinion in human experience, everything that can and will happen, like has happened. And so good marketing, just like a good short story is just a, a rearranging of stuff that already exists that tells a story that, yeah, that people can resonate with. I want to add to my statement a little bit, because I think, I still think what I, I still believe what I said, I think that's true to a degree. And Basically, the sentiment that he expresses in that line of that book, like, I, yeah, I, I'll put my stamp on that. I think it's accurate, but I don't think it necessarily captures everything because 
there are also examples of maybe the scope of what we call advertisement has also changed over the years because there's been things that have happened that are like they stand out and are affected because they're unexpected and things you haven't thought of before. It's just a random example, but there was this brand and I wasn't prepared with this. I can't remember who it was. I should go look it up. I can't remember what the brand was. <laughs> Maybe it was not effective advertisement then. Never mind. <laughs> At the, I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't exposed to the advertisement firsthand. I read about the advertisement later. So it, I'll, I'll assume it was effective for those who experienced it firsthand. But it was about being smarter. And like it was like a technology company about um, smart solutions to, to problems. And it was they had this these installations around the city where they put up like their billboards were functional. So there's like a billboard on the side of a wall and the bottom of the the billboard stuck out to create like a little bench. So you could like sit on the billboard, like on the sign basically. And this message had something to do about um, solving a problem, like like take a rest or something like it, making life easy or something. Another one Mm -hmm. thing where you could like, oh, I can't, I don't want to misspeak now. I got to pull it up. I shouldn't guess anymore. There was other things. The signs did things that they, the, the physical sign themselves served a purpose within the environment. And it was showing how like we can help make good things happen. What, what does that connect to that is an idea we are a relationship? We already, I guess maybe it's the idea that technology can help you. I mean, maybe, I guess you maybe you can, you could say there's a connection or like, well, I, I would say it's, it's still rearranging things that, that, already exist and that people already know but in an unexpected manner so like we're already used to seeing advertisements on benches like that's Mm -hmm. normal um we're used to seeing messages about products that make our lives easier but then putting them together into something that you can interact with maybe hasn't necessarily happened Mm -hmm. putting the the story of the ad into a physical space that makes sense for it is what makes that interesting, but it's still just a rearranging of yeah. concepts and stuff that. So would you say, I know we have our main topic to get to I'll, I'll, I won't take too much, to do, but <laughs> I, know. I want to, throw I know, I'm, sorry. Part, I'm not sure how I think about this. I'm just going to throw another random example and you can help paint the picture, help show me if there's a connection. And again, you have to you have to decide how you're going to interpret an effective, successful genius ad. Do you remember the Super Bowl commercial, the Puppy Monkey Baby for like Mountain Dew? Puppy Monkey Baby. You don't remember that? Oh, I don't think so. I don't remember that. We'll pull it up later, or maybe I'll maybe we'll splice it here in the in the editing now. Okay. But um, it was this. It was. I'm wondering if, if that content applies to even advertising strategy, even if the content itself is unexpected. Puppy Monkey Baby, you really haven't seen it? You're a member of Vice Reddit. It was this total, it was Wait, totally- Wait, let's, let's pause it. Okay. Let me go watch it real quick. Okay. So then I can react. Puppy Monkey Baby. Puppy Monkey Baby. This makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> Hey, that was that was special. So you've seen it. You now have to have nightmares like the rest of us who have seen that. It could be argued that that was not effective or was. And again, that'd be, that, that's a whole different thing. We could dive into a whole episode about what maybe we should, what makes an effective that right. But yeah. that one, I, I think I was in the boardroom when they decided on that or approved it. I think it was just like it was a Super Bowl commercial. So it's like let's be so memorable that we stand out from the rest some humor and you know kind of funny and just kind of shock value that it's like people are gonna puppy monkey baby it's like this thing and you're talking about it and you remember that was mountain dew and you see in the store that that product in the you know the gas station whenever and you're like okay puppy monkey baby it has nothing to do with a brand value a benefit the flavor the price tag the better than competitor it was just like you will you will remember this and it will stick in your head is it that Shock value and kind of surprising content humor is a repeated thing, but is that does that break the system of what you just read, or is that supply? <laughs> and maybe you just say no, it doesn't. I mean, or puppies, monkeys, and babies all existed already, so <laughs> <laughs> just maybe not combined in that way. We'll catch two weeks from now, and you can see if you you tell me if you're still thinking of Puppy Monkey Baby after that, and if it wasn't your worm. Okay, yeah, I'll post a, a follow up on TikTok or something. 
anyways, I don't know. We can think about that, but that's another example. Like it's so off. It, it's a different kind of advertising where it's like this. The only purpose of this is that you're going to remember it. Is that worthwhile? I don't know. Maybe Mountain Dew thinks it was if they saw return on it. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I would say it is in my mind. This is going to sound weird, but that ad makes me think of like that is like a Seinfeld episode. Like nothing happens, but everything happens, <laughs> and that's just hmm. I don't know. It does it does fit kind of the target, I mean, what I'm assuming their target market was in the sense that, like, just kind of, like, young people, gamers, people that you – know, Mountain Dew isn't, like, a very – as a refined high-status drink, right? And it's not a little kid, like, like you know, grade school type drink either. It's just, right. like, older teenagers, young adults. It's kind of a – the people we talk about. Taco Bell also drink Mountain Dew. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. And so it fits that kind of, those kind of products. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Similar types of, you just be goofy and funny. And you remember us when it's time to get the munchies, you pick up the Mountain Dew and try it. Like, yeah. You know what, Camden? I'm going to say that that ad was on brand. I think we need a stamp. Like, boom. That was on brand. A sting. We can hit the button every time. On brand. Boom. On brand. Yeah. I. Interesting. Okay. I don't know how to equate that to the quote that I brought up, but <laughs> I, I like these tangents. That was fun. The way before he saw that ad, I guess, and so he didn't. He had to reevaluate his, his formula. He would have saw Puppy Monkey Baby, but well, I, I when did this ad come out? I don't remember the last. I'm not sure. I, I I have a feeling this story was written before before the ad happened. Anyway, okay, shall we get to the main topic? Let's do it. This was also something that I chose. Uh, then I learned a really interesting fact about you. Interesting, sad, lame, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but yeah. Yeah, which, but I think it actually might make for this conversation to be a little bit more interesting. Okay. So I like movies. I watch a lot of movies. And I have quite an affinity for A24. I think they've built themselves a really interesting brand. They always deliver a solid product. And I kind of wanted to talk about them a little bit and why I think they're successful and why I think they've um, started to m melt into the minds of our generation a little bit of moviegoers. Um, so that's what I want to talk about. But then I learned you don't... You don't you don't think you've ever seen a single A twenty four film? I thought I had probably, and then in preparation for this, I was coming through, and I'm like, oh crap, I don't think I, I I've heard of almost all of them. I haven't at least the list I saw. Maybe there how many are there? Is there like hundreds, thousands? Like is there? There's uh, let me see. Oh, I wish they were numbered. Um, that I that's like a top twenty list or something like that. I was and I hadn't seen any of those ones. Oh, there's probably close to a hundred though. Okay, not that I'm aware of, but yeah, I should we should we pause and and you look at this list? Oh sure, let's pause again okay. real quick. Bink. I don't know these ones. I don't know these ones. The Bling Ring I know has Emma Watson and it's like these high schoolers or something, and it's like a coming of age thing. I think I don't really know much. I, I think so too. I haven't seen either. Of I don't know these ones. I don't know these ones. I've heard oh, any of the two are David Foster Wallace. I, it was a biopic about him. Oh, nice. I think I've seen clips or trailers or something about Amy, about Amy Winehouse. That's the one I may have seen. I, I know I've seen a documentary about Amy Winehouse. So maybe that was what, maybe I have seen. So maybe, maybe you have seen an A24 film. I kind of forgot that they did a couple documentaries. If that was a different documentary than it was in that one, but I don't know. Um, Room is excellent. The Witch is probably one of my favorite horror movies of all time. So it's straight up horror. Huh? I've heard of the Adderall Diaries. I don't know where I heard that or why. Don't I've never seen it. But The Lobster is the one that I always see. Like, uh, like I think it's on Netflix where it was, where it's like the dude and he's like hugging, but it's like cut out. So it's like hugging nothing. Like he. That's how, that's how I view it anyway. It's like it's like a guy like has arm around blankness. That makes sense. Uh, I don't remember. I did see the lobster, but it was definitely one of the weirdest movies I've seen. 
and it, I I kind of got a little lost. Green Room was fun. Swiss Army Man was super weird. Have you seen that one? You haven't seen that one. It has no. Paul Dano and Daniel Radcliffe in it. Ooh. I and yeah, and Daniel Radcliffe is like dead. Man. And it's Paul Dano's like relationship with this dead person on like a deserted island. It was really weird. That sounds like an age. Really weird. Okay, keep going. I don't know these ones. I don't know these ones. Moonlight won um, Moonlight, Best Picture. The whole Best Picture and the meme because they miss they announced it wrong and stuff like that. So I've heard of Moonlight. Yeah. But I've never seen it. <clears throat> I saw it comes at night. That was good. I love all A24 horror movies. They're just... That's another thing, is I don't watch them all horror they're, movies. They're great at horror. I mean, they do a lot more than horror, but like psychological they're horror. horror right? Not the main thing. Um, No, not always. No. Some of it's pretty... Uh, it's just straight up <laughs> horror movie. I've heard a ghost story is good. I haven't seen that. I've seen it. I know Good Time has Robert Pattinson's. It's like the Safety Brothers. Well, yeah, Safety Brothers. I know it's like a crime inner city kind of storyline but and i know that there's been like a lot of memes from that for some reason i think it was just because like robert pattinson in an unexpected role or something but i've i keep hearing i know not memes all i know is robert pattinson's in it and it's he's in the other one he's in the is it the lighthouse what's the one with willem dafoe is it called the lighthouse yeah yeah that's really really good so I know about those ones. Yeah, I haven't seen them. I don't know these ones. I don't know these ones. Uh, the Killing of a Sacred Deer is a really good psychological horror movie. Okay. I know of Lady Very Bird. Disturbing. Lady Bird won awards and it was, um, what's her name? Uh, Saoirse Ronan. Am I saying her name right? I, I will have to take your word for it. I don't think I've I haven't seen there's a lot here. Hereditary. That was a big deal here in Utah because it was filmed up in Park City. I think I've heard of that one. Eighth Grade was the Bo Burnham one about the girl in eighth grade. Like, it's pretty, obviously, just kind of a coming of age film as well. Just kind of a realistic with like social media and kind of the modern age challenges of. But you haven't, how do you know all that, but you haven't seen it? It's, it's, it's in the zeitgeist, it's in pop culture. Like, I, I just. I don't even know that. You don't know that? Have you not seen 8th grade? Uh-uh, I haven't. He, he cast like a real 8th grader. No, but again, I haven't seen it. Do you say, Same with The Farewell. Do you say Midsommar or Midsummer? Midsummer. Summer. I know that one. I've seen... That's the one I I've, I've, have still not seen the movie, but I've seen a lot of clips of. I pretty much know the storyline. And you talked to me about that one, too. So I know about... Like, I, I, I bought the director's cut, so if, oh. if you want to borrow it, you just let me know. So that's one that, yeah, although I haven't seen it, it's probably the one I'm most, I feel like I've seen to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a unique kind of like horror, right? It's not a dark jump scare, Halloween-y. It's like this weird psychological horror, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a well, of violence, yeah. but it's not like, it's, it's, it's a very bright, flowy, flowery, sunny, daytime type of horror. Y yes. Yeah. It's not dark. There's no real, like, jump scares or anything. It's very, yeah, it's very different. Uncut Gems. Yeah. Uncut Gems. That one I would like. You remember that meme? Yes. And, yes. and uh, Adam Sandler in a different kind of role. Yes, very good. Very, very good. That's not a horror movie, and I've seen it. See, I do watch some movies that aren't scary. So what? You liked it? Yeah. You think that Adam Sandler should have won an award for it? Yes. Or at least have gotten a nomination. At least. The fact that he didn't even get a nomination is just like a crime. Dang. Um, oh, I watched Lamb. Lamb is bizarre very bizarre <laughs> you just see oh yeah you like the weirdest things man i i do i do and this one's this one was not really uh not a horror movie by just any weird. stretch of the imagination it's just strange 
<laughs> and and really good, really good. So when you say really good, what do you mean by what makes a really good A twenty four film? Uh it, I think, and and we can I I'll recap this again later. But in my mind, like a when I think of an A twenty four film, I think of something that is on the unexpected side of a narrative and usually well-produced, well-acted. Um, and the story is always kind of first and foremost. It always has a good story. There's never been, I don't think I've seen, even the ones that are like mediocre as far as movies go, the story or the idea behind it is always really interesting. Pearl is great. I'm more the shell with shoes on get in there. I, I, there was, they did a little movie. I haven't seen it though. No, but like, it's, like, where, like where it started, like the little YouTube videos, you know? It just, yeah. It seems like the doesn't, one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't think, like, unless, unless I saw the Amy Winehouse one, which I probably haven't, probably something else. I don't know if I've ever seen it. Any film. Non cultured film. That's okay. That's okay. I'll forgive you. But I, I mean, I think that'll make for some interesting points here. So a little bit about their background, if I could, before we start diving into their brand itself. But um, they're founded by three guys um, who were already sort of established in the business, but they wanted to kind of start their own thing. David Finkel, Daniel Katz, and John Hodges. Um, not the comedian John Hodges. Uh, but I'm I had never, until I started doing research for this episode, I didn't know their names. They have like zero public personality or connection really to the brand, which is interesting. Ooh. But they were founded about 10 years ago. Um, we just talked about a whole bunch of their films. One of the things that, that interested me is they were sort of founded on the idea of just wanting to do things better and different and not be held to some of the same processes and practices of other um, studios, other production companies. So that's kind of where they um, initially started to set themselves apart. And then uh, one of the things that I found a really great um, GQ article from a few years ago, both interviewing the the founders, but then some people who have worked with them in the past. And it seems like uh, a lot of the actors like Brie Larson and Daniel Radcliffe were all talking about how um, A24 really prioritizes the, the story over other things and they don't try to handhold or push agendas on the filmmakers themselves so they're they're much more committed to like the actual product than selling merch and stuff yeah. beyond right. um which is cool and then another thing that i probably is going to require its own episode if i can find enough information but it seems like when they got started they really focused heavily on digital marketing only hmm. they didn't do much tradi traditional not a lot of like tv buys or anything very focused on social media and they used a lot of um heavy analytics they worked with a couple of marketing agencies that were very focused on data gathering and parsing so that they could be really really specific with their marketing so that's why you don't you don't hear broad pushes about A24 films, but people talk about them. Yeah. It's because it's getting to the people who really care, and then those people talk about them. That kind of yeah. spreads. So their whole marketing plan is fascinating. That's something that I, having not been one who's who's seen their uh, their content, their 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 films, I've still been able to kind of get the vibe from what I've seen from the from the sideline that they like you said, really, really focusing on a storyline and kind of the people who really 
are invested in those kind of stories are the ones like they reach maybe a small, it's not maybe a widespread audience. Like some of these, these other productions that are just mass, you know, get into as many theaters as possible, as many butts in seats, so to speak. They're not doing that, but though they're, but then they, since they kind of target down to who they is going to enjoy it, the people who like them really like them. Like it's not, I've like the fact that I've already, I've heard of them and kind of know about like this, this this fandom or this cult following of A24 films, when's the next one coming out? Like I've I've known of that about that. Um because it's because it's real, because it exists obviously, right? Like and I was doing a little yeah. research before this to see if I had seen any movies. There's lots <laughs> of like lists and videos about like ranking them, ranking like top, you know, twenty A twenty four, my favorite A twenty four, the worst A twenty four. And people there people care enough about that to then observe and rank and evaluate movies specifically within that from that production company it's not just Mm -hmm. like there's people want to look at them as their own thing and evaluate them like anyways there's there's a there's a brand distinction so yeah 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 it's 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 really interesting because i i was trying to think like yeah i guess universal has a a bit of a following and but that's mainly because of the franchises it owns Mm -hmm. And Disney is its own beast. It is it they buy other brands and stuff like that too. Like A24 is its own from the ground. Yeah. But. You don't like see a trailer for a movie and then see it's, oh, it's a universal film. I'm really excited for that. Like, but I get that when I see like an A24 trailer. Mm-hmm. It's like an intangible. There's like a, a little bit of like a a vibe or a tone or a color overlay i don't even know what i could call it that just like so it feels like it ties them together it's like you can watch a movie not know where it's from and know it's an a24 film you can't identify what it is if there's something like i i don't know i don't know i was trying to think about that as i was prepping and i don't know if i could like call out specifically what it is and that's interesting because it's not the same director every time. It's not the same, you know, cast or genre even every time. But you, mm-hmm. interesting. So what is, maybe we'll, maybe we'll touch on that, but as someone who's not as familiar with them as you, what, if you were to take the whole breadth of them, obviously there's there's varied storylines and genres and styles. What are the main ingredients of an A24? If you're going to make an A24 movie, what do you pull in? What are, what are the consistent things that you expect to be involved in their, one of their productions? A very out-of-the-box storyline, like not something terribly typical. Or if it sounds typical, there's going to be a, a twist that you don't see coming. Um, I would say the... Acting and dialogue has always been very strong. Even the even the foreign films that I've seen that have subtitles and stuff that they've done, like Lamb, I think. Um, more real, more like how people actually talk, and less. Yeah, it's, like how it's there's not like any attempts at one liners or whatever. They're just they're a little more natural feeling in their yeah. production. Maybe that's what it is. There's there's something very unproduced about their production they have a lot of long scenes i'm asking i'm not i'm not trying to maybe i could be totally wrong about that but the little bit of clips i've seen i feel like they go on longer i you know i haven't noticed that about their cinematography though in general hmm. I, I do appreciate just a few clips i've seen i've kind of noticed that but oh i wish i could oh it's gonna kill me uh the director and cinematographer who did like the Revenant and Gravity, um, Children of Men. Ah, we'll we'll find it and put it here. But that's what I usually think of. There's like a, a pair that mm. do some really great long shots. Oh, I cut you off though. Have you seen Children of Men? No. Oh, that's just I. That's one I always preach about. If I can get somebody interested in it. It's, it's starting, one of my favorites. Starting point for for just good movie making. Oh. Yeah, it has. Um, it's not an A twenty four film. Oh, um, I thought it was A twenty four. No, no, it has Clive Owen and Julianne Moore in it. A little post apocalyptic, like women can't have babies anymore, but 
suddenly there is one. So it's this group of people trying to protect this pregnant mother. Hmm. It's really interesting. I I can appreciate that's that's the main draw why I, I need to get into CCMA's movies is that they I, I like thoughtful and like the effort behind the storyline right because I feel like, yeah. I feel like it also leads to better acting like you can you can act better if the story's better to be acted right but but I kind of cut you off though is there any other ingredients you had that you think are synonymous with, with an A twenty four film synonymous I think I just learned that word. Um, I would say lately they've been, they have started engaging in more like, um, brand name directors, not brand name, but like directors who have a reputation of their own, Hmm. um, a little bit more. So like Darren Aronofsky, who's got the whale coming out and Ty West, um, who's, who did a couple good horror movies this year. Uh, having some of those names, I oh I think oh I'm seeing here on the list, Joel Cohen was a director in a film yes uh, last year. I haven't seen that one yet. So how does that but, work? Uh, like hmm? how does that work? Do they um are they going recruiting directors for their are they coming up with stories? Or how are people asking that they'll produce their film or how how is it going that something decides that it's going to be an H one four film? You know that's something we should ask someone who's in the business, but. I think like initially they were simply financing things, financing it. Well, I think they were just, I think they started as a distributor. So they were, Oh, the internet's going to light me up for this. But I think it was like close to finished productions looking for a distributor um, would get their help. And then, over the last few years, A24 has started producing their own films. So, and that would be more like they find a script or a director has an idea and they agree to fund it, produce it. So do you know, I mean, how aware are you? And again, I'm, I'm asking totally not, not familiar. Are they aware and intentional about their brand to the degree that are they pretty picky about who they work with? Or do they have like a criteria you're aware of? Or are they just, but obviously it's a pretty consistent, you, like you said, you can recognize an A24 film when you see one. How do mm-hmm. you think that is? Or how, or how not intentional, but how like protective of that expectation do you think that, that they are? I mean, from my, my experience anyway, I think the fact that there's, a consistent quality to their films like sure it's a range like anything but you can always expect like a b movie or better like they definitely have a commitment to high quality ideas and then producing them well so i don't think as i I think they're still kind of considered like an indie production house so i think they're they're even though they've got more of a brand name now than they had five years ago. Um, You don't see them trying to franchise things or go bigger than what they know is in their wheelhouse. Mm. So that's interesting to me. And that feels intentional because I think they, they definitely have some enough clout now that I think they could pursue bigger projects if they wanted to. Do you, uh, do they ever do, um, sequels are there any any repeats and not repeats like the same movie but the sequels in their in their lineup or are they all pretty one-offs so as far as i as far as i know the only like series of films that i know of are um the movies x and pearl and then there's going to be a third one called maxine um and those are all in the same universe, same storyline. But that also, like, they didn't... What was interesting with that is, like, X came out. It was really good. Um, I just saw it recently, but I guess it came out back in March. And got really good reviews. It was, like, a 92 or 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. And people loved it. And then the director was like... Surprise, I got a sequel coming up, and it was actually a prequel to it. Mm. And then shortly after, 
he announced that when he announced he had a third one and it wasn't like they were promoting it as it's going to be this but it's kind of turned into are that. movies are those three ones that if you if you didn't see them in order that they would still be standalone movies because like that's because they're, they're not named like two and three like they're they all have their own unique names that don't necessarily connect them if you didn't know they were connected is did, did they yeah them? i well the the third one's not out yet so i couldn't tell you but x and pearl very much stand alone but you can appreciate them better if yeah. if you know them both hmm. like i watched x assuming it was a standalone movie and that there wasn't more coming and it was excellent and then Pearl just kind of expanded the storyline, but then if you watched Pearl without having seen X, it's it's not going to harm your experience. Cool. So thinking about branding and trying to capture in again what the essence is of a brand, being being able to. Oh well, yeah, I'll also ask the question: If you were to have like a twenty four as if it was a person, not the people who are necessarily the ones running it, but if the brand was a person over for like dinner, what would they be like? What is A24's person? Oh. What, what would conversation be like? What would their manners be like? Yeah. It would be kind of a... semi-hipster, but not like aggressive hipster guy um, who definitely is well-educated and likes his IPAs but he doesn't rub it in your face. He's like, he's like the hipster that's so hipster, he's not trying to be hipster. Is there a celebrity you can compare that to? Who embodies A24? Because they don't. Maybe, maybe because he's part of like the current zeitgeist, but like Keanu Reeves as a human being, not as like, not actor Keanu Reeves, but like human. Keanu Reeves, like just a cool, nice guy who authentic, real does good things. Hmm, cool. Okay. Yeah. Understanding the brand a little more. My next question is, can you think of an example of, again, I'm asking you to kind of take that and apply it to some other thing that it's not, but like, let's take like, um, well, I won't even limit you. I'll let you to pick the category. Is there another brand in a totally different, not movies at all, that you think is kind of similar to the A24? Can you compare it to anyone or is it just beyond comparison? I know that's a weird question on the spot, especially, but. I would maybe equate it a little bit to like early and maybe a little bit current HBO. Like they are, they do their own thing. HBO is known for its high quality TV series. And they're all very unique, but you all, you expect a certain level of, um, of expertise and goodness there. Goodness. That's not the word, but you know what I mean? Okay. Hmm? My goodness, you mean like quality? Yes. Okay. Well, like goodness, like does good for the world kind of thing. Well, I mean, maybe it does. <laughs> good stories do good things. Okay. I don't. I don't know how much Game of Thrones did good for the world, but definitely, I enjoyed it anyway. You think you? You're a guy. You described um, the brand over at your house making IPAs as a guy. Is it mostly a male audience that you think is into these films, or is it pretty evenly split? I don't think, I think it's, it's probably individual uh, as a brand. I don't know. I don't know who their like ideal persona is. And it might be a little bit different because they do a lot of horror. So that could be one of their personas. They do a lot of like thoughtful dramas. So that could be a certain persona um, that they're going for. Oh, I, I'll have to think about that one a bit more, but I don't think it's all bros. I know, um, Midsummer has a a huge female audience. Nice. Are they always in theaters? Like, how is there is there anything that have have not been in theaters? 
I think, well, looking at this list that we were just looking at, I think they've got a few that were distributed by like Apple TV um, or Showtime. Um, I think they've had a couple that were direct with uh, Amazon, maybe. I might be making that one up. I know they had a like a post theatrical deal with Amazon for a while. I want you to critique their logo. When you're done looking at Twitter. I'm looking at a picture here. Some of this out. I'm looking at pictures here. There's, and this probably isn't going to translate very well to producing this on the YouTube channel, but they have a different logo for like every film that they come out with. They do do a lot of variations, which is, which is pretty cool. The, the one at the, I think it was like bottom left there, the white with the black letters. That's kind of their, okay, their standard typical logo. It's creating the same kind of logo, same shape with every different items or mm -hmm. the same logo. Um, I like it. I don't want to critique a logo too much without as being someone who's not as familiar as I should be with what they're going after, where they've been, what their audience is. Like, I don't want to ask a lot of those questions if I was working with them to help. Um, Do you know where their name came from? And I don't, I was assuming it was something like a, the studio or something, the room where it started, but I don't know if that's accurate. It, it does have something to do with its origin. I, I can't remember which one of the founders it was, but it was the name of the road he was on in Italy driving when he decided he wanted to start his own <laughs> company. Nice. That's cool. So this we're going like way long here and we can cut a lot of this if we want to. But I'm curious, like, is this I, I we all know the the name A twenty four and we know what it means when we say it, but it has zero connection to like making movies in and of itself. How do you feel about brand names that like don't have a, a true like direct connection to the product? I've asked myself this question a few times and I'll ask myself again because I always question how I feel about it and it I'm my opinion changes over time probably. But I feel it's funny because as someone who in my day to day career I, I help brands come up with either evaluate their current names or come start from scratch and, and decide a name. As as someone who does that, it's funny because I actually I actually feel like I'm be careful I say this. You can have a you, yes, you can have a bad brand name, I think, but it's hard to have a bad brand name because your brand name is what you make it. Like it, it, it's easier it's easier to have a bad rebrand than to have a bad brand from scratch, if that makes sense. Because if you have no recognition, you decide with your brand messaging, your your visual identity, the personality, the way, the tone of voice, everything you do, the way you market, establish what that is in people's minds if you do it well and it's consistent. And so no matter what you're called, you can put something behind it. If uh, there, But yeah, rebrands, you want to be a little more careful as you're changing your name. But so A24, and especially in creative type of things, movie production, musical, we talked about bands before, you and I about band names, um, or, you know, the, the, if an artist that chooses their, their, not pen name, what do you call when it's like when you're an artist that has a different name? your artistic name. stage name stage name sure i'm talking like visual like artists but anyways it's harder to uh pick a bad one i think you just pick what it is and, and you can like a24 yeah nothing to do specifically with film but therefore it's also not attached to be any specific expectation other than what a24 means a24 means something to you and all the people who are fans of it and they would all describe it a little bit differently but if they had something like weird movie incorporated like which, which would never be their name obviously right you expect it to be a weird movie and if it's not weird you're like wait a minute you guys are weird movie incorporated or if it's action films you know it, they would limit themselves but something like in, in creative efforts i feel like especially you see in band names which is a unique kind of brand right where everyone has like a personal brand sometimes band members will like all change so that 10 years down the road no one is like from the original band anymore but they have the same name <laughs> So what is, yeah. what, what is a band's brand? Anyways, but um, 
yeah, you could pick any people throw names at a dart board, you know, or throw darts at, at names on a board or pick out the dictionary. I don't know if you know the that punk band back in the day or the emo band Red Jumpsuit Apparatus. They just yeah. they just had a bunch of random words and they just picked three of them, put them together, and that's that's their band name. Does that mean they could have had a better one? Maybe, but now people know what that mean that that band is about because they built a brand. So anyway, sorry, long winded answer. My short answer is I think it works fine as long as people are understanding what it means to them and it's relatively consistent in how they view it. Whether there was a better name they could have picked or something, I don't know, but I don't think it's bad because you you make what your brand name is. Not to say there doesn't need to be any strategy behind it. Not not to say that people should stop working with our agency, agency that we work at and help, help with your brand name because I think there is some, especially besides just coming up with a name, there's a lot. It's important to vet the name to ch- check out how much noise there is in the space, trademark ability, domain availability, depending on what your business does and stuff. So yes, you can still pick a bad brand name. But I don't have a very specific criteria. I try not to do what makes a good brand name. It's what you make it a lot of times. Yeah. No, I I I I think I actually agree with you. Like what? I know. I know. Uh yeah, because A twenty four means nothing. But by choosing that as their name at the beginning of their inception, it allowed them to kind of become whatever Mm -hmm. they made they made the name mean something rather than the name dictating who they were and that's yeah yeah i could definitely see how that to your point about that being easier at the beginning than trying to go through a rebrand because in a rebrand you're trying to name something that already exists do you think a, a movie or a film production house is a very unique type of brand, and, a, and there's not. It's not like there's like thousands of them that are all competing equally for. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are people that make movies of all kinds, but like the there's a lot more people who are making types of bread than there are people who are making movies, right? There's kind of a, a smaller group at the top. So bread was a random example I just used, but um, <laughs> so it's unique in that sense. Do you think? We try to we, we try to explain what the A24 brand is, which is obviously hard to put into words something that's like an essence that you experience. Do you think that if that day one when that guy was on that street, A24 decided, to, could he have planned and thought out, I want to make a company that does that, whatever you try to describe the A24 brand, could that have intentionally been planned and built toward or did they have to just start going about and see what came about i mean they had like a vision of what they the kinds of movies they wanted to do but do you have to kind of see what your brand is and then lean into it or could it have been pre-planned all of it i i mean i i think there's i kind of like just what you and i are doing here with this experiment we have a name sort of on brand we don't know what it's going to turn into. Um, we built flexibility into the name. <laughs> uh, and it's probably going to look very different than kind of either what we planned or uh, what it ends up being like, yeah, in like in a couple of months or even a couple of years. So like, I bet they had a, a solid idea of what they wanted to do, but then probably how it manifests itself yeah. into a brand essence, if you will, probably yeah. came later. I think that's something really hard to plan. It is. And the reason I, I'll wrap up my last thought here, unless you have a question or anything, is in thinking, applying this to, to the work we do, right? This is my slight more academic section of this, of this, uh, um, part of the episode is that what I try to help people do when they're trying to rebrand or build up a new brand or, or a brand strategy in any way is understand that one, you don't really control your brand entirely. Your brand is, is slightly different in the minds of everybody who has experience with your brand. 
you have a million different brands because it's how people perceive you. The best you can try to do is do things consistently and intentional enough to influence most of those perceptions to be somewhat similar and unified enough that there's some overlap that's that that is your brand, how they how they view you. And so you're never going to fully prepare or fully plan that and control that. And two, you don't want to because if you get too controlled and this is our brand from the very beginning, you'll miss opportunities to to adapt to new things or to, to change in some way that would have been for your benefit. And so you need to be flexible enough. So what I try to help people do is, and again, it's easier said than done, what we try to help people do is say, okay, what do you think you want to be? Let's let's establish what those influences or what those overlaps, what those core essence is enough that you have a direction, but then you've got to be moving. You're never going to pre-plan and package up perfectly our brand. And you shouldn't try to, you should say, these are the core tenets. This is the kind of the personality we want to have. This is, and I say the word essence, we often build what we call a core essence for a lot of a lot of the brands we work with and say, what is the, the example we always use in, in our, our work is Disney lately because Disney has a very well-known or well-recognized core essence being magic. Like, yeah, they have theme parks, they have uh, television and movies, they have merchandise, they have all kinds of stuff. Disney's been buying up everybody, right? But at their core, and they'll actually tell you this if you go to their their leadership uh, marketing training that they offer, at the core, it's supposed to be a sense of magic. That's what makes it a Disney product or experience. And so if you kind of identify what that core essence is, and stick to that, then you can be on brand for now, but knowing that you're going to adapt new elements to that. You're going to, you know, Wendy's is going to have this, Wendy's is going to have this, this idea of like the no cutting corners, authentic um, hamburgers, but then also Wendy Twitter is going to go off and have this kind of, this sassy, unexpected, you know, Twitter account that kind of become part of their brand. And so Anyways, whole different episode, right? But like you, you shouldn't try to totally control your brand, but you shouldn't go into things without with just totally seeing what happens. You need to start somewhere say, I think you want to be this and then be ready to adapt it as it goes. Easier said than done, but that's my little brand strategy soapbox for, for this episode, I guess. <laughs> I think, I, I think you're spot on. It, it is a delicate balance to figure out how to define yourself without building strict walls i'm still trying to figure out how to do that as a human thanks to my therapist good so did your therapist sponsor this episode <laughs> <laughs> i forgot who our sponsor was okay camden who's who's our actual sponsor this week we are proud actual unofficial sponsor yes our sponsor this week is uh, fruit striped gum um we're grateful for their support they uh, wanted they wanted us to make sure that we plug that yes they are still around selling gum, um, and they uh, it's still fruit stripe. So thank you fruit stripe gum for sponsoring this. And once again, if you want to be uh, a sponsor of our of our next episode or coming episodes, comment on our on our video here or send us a message through social media at sort of on brand. We'd be happy to work with you. I totally forgot they existed. I really. That's why they wanted us to sponsor Stripe Gum. Yeah, now you know. Well, thanks a lot, Fruit Stripe Gum. This was fun, Camden. I appreciate it, as always. Same, same. See you next time. Peace. See ya.